Okay, last week uh, I was, of course, preaching at what was our guest service, Christmas guest service. If you were here, were you here? If you were here, maybe you remember how I began the service. So I began the sermon by saying that Christians at this time of year can moan. That we can grumble quite a bit at Christmas. We tend to bemoan the fact that our society has too small a view of Christmas. It's all about, isn't it? Mince pies. It's all about family together. It's all about presents. And we moan about the fact that our culture has lost sight of the splendor, the grandeur of the incarnation, and the utter significance of the fact that God has become man. Here's a thought. Could it be that it's not just the people out there that have too small a view of Christmas? Could it actually be that we in here are guilty of the same thing? So if I was to ask you, why is it that Christ came? How are we verbalizing that? What are we saying? What would you say? Christ came. Christ came. Christ came to die. Christ came to provide moral teaching. Christ came to forgive our sins. Great. Is that it? Or could there be more to it? Is the purpose of the incarnation even grander and more mighty than that? Well, this evening, what we're going to do is we're going to look at that portion of Scripture we read in Isaiah chapter 11, a section about Emmanuel, the king that was promised. And as we look at this, what I think is we'll see that it isn't just the people in London, it isn't just the people out there, but we too perhaps should have a bigger, brighter, mightier, grander view of what God did in the incarnation and what he became man to achieve. So, where are we? What do we need to do? We need to turn to Isaiah chapter 11, don't we? So, if we could do that together, uh, it is on page 575, Isaiah chapter 11, um, as we consider, first of all, the promise of a coveted king. It's the first thing I want you to think about tonight with me, the promise of a coveted king. Right, let's get in Isaiah 11. The reality is I don't want to spend too much time here with you on the context and the situation. In fact, really all that I want you to appreciate is the fact that it's a really gloomy time in the history of Israel, right? It's a really dark time. Um, it's, what is it? It's 8th century BC and Ahaz. Do you remember Ahaz? Maybe? Ahaz is the king in the southern kingdom of Judah, okay? And Ahaz has really had a choice to make, a decision to make, okay? So Ahaz has been faced with the impending threat of this uh, invasion from Assyria. And so here's the choice Ahaz has got. He can either choose to obey God, trust God, even with this threat of this army approaching, he can choose to trust God, or Ahaz can choose to try and make a truce with the Assyrians. If you know your history, Do you remember what Ahaz does? Which way do you think he goes? Yeah, unfortunately, Ahaz goes to Assyria. He disobeys God, and that is a decision that leads to the utter crushing of the Assyrian army, but it's also a decision that leads to God's promised chastisement of Judah itself. I warned you, it wasn't rosy, it's pretty gloomy. So it's gloomy, it's dark, it's depressing for Israel, but it's all hope gone, and it's all hope lost. Well, no. In the previous chapters here, what God has done is begun to unfold the promise of a deliverer for his people, a savior, an individual that is going to rise up, something that he unfolds further in Isaiah chapter 11. So, that's the context. What do you want to know? Tell you what I want to know. I want to know more about this deliverer. That sounds good. That sounds a bit more promising. So if you take your Bible, got your Bible? Let's look at it. First thing I want you to look is his beginnings, the beginnings in verse 1. So who is this individual? Do you see it? We're told of what is it? A shoot that will come forth from where? 
stump of Jesse. I think everybody gets the idea there, right? A a shoot coming forth from the stump. I think I illustrated it uh, last time we looked at Isaiah and looked at this. Didn't I? I talked about a tree that was in our garden in Woodford Green, this massive tree that had got way out of control and the neighbors were complaining about the tree. So we had to cut down the tree. And I was really impressed. I thought the gardeners did a cracking job. You know, they got rid of it, took it down, like poisoned the stump, left this dead, decayed stump in the ground. I thought, brilliant, great job. And I was wrong because a couple of months later, I go out into the garden. What do I see? I a shoot has sprung up and uh, obviously what looked dead was anything but that's the idea here right is it it is but I love it because look at the language look at the last verse of chapter 10 so did you see it it's about cutting down and it's a forest and so do you see that unlike with Assyria where God is promising to absolutely cut down the whole forest of Assyria. He's cutting it all down. Unlike with that, you get into verse 1 of chapter 11, what's God promising? God's promising that from Judah will come forth one individual. And from where? From Jesse. What's the promise? The promise is of a coming Davidic king. So we've got the beginnings. Next thing I want you to note is his power. So this king's power. So if you look to verse 2 and just answer me this. Humor me. Answer me this. What is it that qualifies this individual for rule and kingship? If you look at verse 2, what qualifies it? Is it just that he's from the right lineage and the right line? Is it just because he's Davidic? It's not, is it? It's because this, he is endowed with the Spirit of the Lord, isn't he? And crucially, I love this as well, crucially, unlike so many instances of leaders and kings in the Old Testament, do you notice there that the Spirit of the Lord doesn't just equip him for one task or one job? Do you look at the language there. The Spirit, look, rests on him, rests on him. as a permanence here to the endowment of the Spirit. So you with me, everyone, or not? We've got the beginnings, we've got the power, but then the last of these that I want you to notice, uh, the best of them, is the gifting. This is where it gets interesting. I think I remember um, earlier on in the year, I asked you uh, a question. I asked if you liked poetry. (laughs) And I remember asking you the question because I remember getting blank looks back when I asked, do we like poetry or not? That's okay. I'm with you. You know, it's fine. It's okay. It's all right. But you're going to like the poetry here because if you look at verse 2, we've dealt with that first line. But do you look what you've got after the first line of verse 2? Just have a really close look at it. Do you see what you've got? You've got three lines, don't you? Does everyone agree with that? Three lines, and each has a couplet. Each has a pair of attributes that are attributed to the king. Everyone got that? Now, you could be like me in sermon preparation, looking at that, just thinking, oh, that's great, that's nice. The king's awesome. (laughs) You know, like, you could look at it and just think, oh, six random attributes or miscellaneous attributes attributed to the king. That is brilliant. That's great. It's so much cooler than that because, get this, elsewhere in the Bible, elsewhere in Scripture, each of those pairs, each of those couplets are used uh, to speak of different facets of kingly rule. Okay? If you didn't follow that, you will. Let's look at them. So what's the first pair? Do you see? It's wisdom and understanding. So elsewhere in the Bible, in 1 Kings 3, that's used to speak of a king's judicial rule. So the idea that he's just handling of government and he can do it well, okay? What's the next pair? Do you see it's counsel and might? So elsewhere in the Bible, in Isaiah 36, that's used to speak of a king's military rule. So the idea of his strategy and his strength and his valor, that's a judicial rule, military rule. What's the last pair? Please look at it. Do you see what it is? Knowledge and fear of the Lord. Elsewhere, 2 Samuel 23, that's used to speak of a king's spiritual rule, his leading of the people before God. Friends, do you see it? I mean, do you see, if you put all those pieces of the jigsaw, everything that we've said, you put it all together, 
What have you got there? What's promised there? To a people who have witnessed successive failures from their Davidic kings. Failure after failure after failure. At last, God here promises them a king who will not fail. He promises a perfect king. A king who can lead his people well before God. Now, what we're going to do with this section of scripture, what we're going to do tonight. Well, I do think, quite honestly, friend, that this portion of scripture, this prophecy for you, it should do what that, what's the words of that hymn? It should give you strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow, Isaiah 11. I really do. Because we've just gone through an election, haven't we? And uh, I know what that can mean to some people in the room. The results of the election, uh, they can bring despair for some. And for others, the result of the election can bring just utter optimism about the future. But what is it that always happens with an election? Always. What happens? Time goes on, the dust settles, and we are reminded of this. That our leaders are failures. Our leaders are failures. Now, does that sound particularly harsh to you? It's not meant to sound harsh, but you surely see that that is the case. Yes, our politicians can maybe try really hard, and they can try to work on our behalf, but by sinful nature, what happens? What is true of all of our politicians? They are susceptible to greed, like we are, susceptible to abuses of power, like we are, susceptible to lies, like you are, like I am. Now, now what happens there? I mean, come on, what, what happens? Like, do we just get depressed like the rest of the world? Do we despair like the rest of the world? We need not. Because unto us, a child is born, and to us a son is given. And who is this? Who is Jesus of Nazareth? Surely you see from Isaiah 11. He is the one who fulfills all of the words of this prophecy. Isn't that right? Isn't it the case? I mean, who is the Lord Jesus Christ? He is the great Davidic ruler. He's the one spoken of here. And who is the Lord Jesus Christ? He is the one in his baptism who had the Holy Spirit descend on him like a dove and rest rest upon him. And who is the Lord Jesus Christ? Is he not the one who possesses all three of these facets of kingly rule? And he possesses them in great measure, doesn't he? The Lord Jesus Christ, the king who is able to rule perfectly with judicial character, the one who grew in wisdom and stature, the government upon his shoulders. The Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has military character, military rule, the one who is defeated victoriously defeated Satan on that cross. What was the third one? The Lord Jesus Christ is the one who has spiritual character as king, the one who even right now leads his people and his army well before God. Friends, you see what I'm saying? Why should Christmas be bigger in our eyes? Because at long, long last at Bethlehem, we have received the ruler that we so desperately need. So we see the promise of a coveted king. Secondly, we see here the promise of a righteous rule. The promise of a righteous rule. Uh, Do you think I'm right in saying that there is something of an air of anticipation in Britain today at this moment? Do you think there's sort of an element of expectation and a a, a curiosity. I think I'm right. I think that uh, most people, regardless of political affiliation, are really curious to see how Boris is going to get on. (laughs) Isn't that the case? Regardless of our political thoughts or affiliation, we're all kind of sitting there thinking, how is this going to (laughs) go? How is Boris going to get on? Is he going to stick to his uh, manifesto pledges? Is he going to do that? Is he he not? Is there going to be lies? Is there going to be exaggeration? What's Brexit going to look like? There's this question going up and down the country, isn't it? What's the rule going to be like? What's his leadership going to be like? How's Boris going to get on? I think there's something very, very similar to that sort of question going on here. Because from unpacking something of the perfect character of this king, what God does next, you might notice it in verse 3 to 5, what God does next is speak about how this king is going to 
govern? Now, what the rule is going to be like? How is this king going to rule? And if you look at it with me, what you'll see is two elements come to the fore about the rule of this king. The first is this, that the king's rule is just. So can I ask you to look at the page with me? Have a wee look. And then notice, and this stands out, not only in verse 4, if you look at verse 4, not only is this king going to judge the poor, but did you notice the repetition in the stanza or not? From verses 3 to 5, we're twice told that this king's rule, his judgment, is going to be righteous. I don't know about you, but immediately that is a welcome sound in my ear, that this king's rule is going to be righteous and fair and just. Because I don't know what it was like for you prior to the election, but my social media and my wife's social media was crazy in the run-up to the election. Was that the case for you? Obviously, Twitter was going mad, but our friends, our non-Christian friends on the run-up to the election, wow, they were a frenzy to behold, posting every minute of the day about the injustice of this politician and the injustice of this other politician and calling day after day for fairness. We want an equal society. We want equality. We want justice. And I love these people. But I've got to say to you, there's scrambling around in the darkness, desperate for fairness, desperate for a just society, but no idea where to look. But now you look at what is promised in verse 3 here. Look at this. It's lovely, isn't it? Here, this king will judge, we're told, but he's not judging superficially. Do you look at the language in verse 3? Do you see it? So he's not judging according to what he sees or hears. So this is a king who doesn't just listen to the loudest voice. He doesn't just see the person who's pushed their way at the front of the queue. There's real justice here. There's proper. It's justice based on truth, based on reality. Isn't that what you want? I mean, isn't there something in the human heart that desperately desperately wants a fair society, a true society, a just society, and that is what is promised here. But then, the second emphasis is we're shown that this king's rule is divine rule. You may have got it, did you? If not, look at the end of verse 4, please. So we're told, of course, that it's not just one-way justice. This king is going to destroy the wicked. But look how he does it. Look at the language. So this king is going to destroy the wicked with the rod of his mouth. Nicola Sturgeon cannot do that. Okay? She can't destroy the wicked with the rod of her mouth. And Jeremy Corbyn, look as we go on, what's this king? He will kill the evil with the breath of his lips. Jeremy Corbyn cannot do that. You know, Boris Johnson cannot kill the evil, cannot produce justice with the breath of his lips. Do you see it? This isn't an impotent politician. This isn't an inept ruler. This is the king. This is the divine king, the king of kings. Now, what could we do with this? You know what we could do, don't you? What we could do is just show how this reinforces the idea that this here, spoken of as Jesus of Nazareth, isn't it? The just one, the one who has come to preach the good news to the poor, the one who has received judgment from his father. He is the one. What does Revelation 19 tell us? He is the one. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one who has the sword. The sharp sword proceeds from his mouth. We could do that. But instead, I want to speak to you if you're not a Christian. Is that you, friend, not professing faith this evening in the Lord Jesus Christ? Please listen. I want you to understand it isn't make believe. Like this, Isaiah 11, and it is, it's, it's beautiful language and some of it's poetic language. And of course, I want you to understand it isn't fable and it isn't just a fairy tale. You understand that, yes, it's true. Christ has come. He is in, incarnate to become king. Yeah, to inaugurate his kingdom. But I need you to understand it is bigger, greater than that. One day, that there is going to become real to your very eyes. 
One day, Christ's kingship will be fully consummated. One day, all of us are going to see it with our eyes and know Christ is king. And guess what? At that very moment, Christ Jesus will execute perfect justice. So if you're not believing, my question to you is very, very, very similar to this morning, deliberately. When that justice comes, that real justice What will that actually mean for you? Like, you're going to be judged not based upon your Instagram feed. Like, you're judged not on the way that you project yourself. You're going to be judged by Christ Jesus not on how you've been able to trick other people into liking you. You're not going to be judged on how other people, their consideration of you, you are going to be judged on how things really are in your heart. What is that going to mean for you? Will will it mean on that day, will it mean that you are found by the Lord Jesus Christ to be trusting in him, to recognize your spiritual poverty in this life and be resting in Christ for salvation? Is that it? I hope so. If not, you will be in the only other group that there is. (laughs) The people who God regards as wicked by their unbelief and a people who are set to face the rod from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a solemn thought, isn't it? But what is the nature of this rule, just and divine? The divine king will judge with justice. So we've seen the the promise of a coveted king and the promise of a righteous rule, but we close tonight, lastly, with the promise of a perfect peace. The promise of a perfect peace. Did you take this election seriously if you were able to vote? Even if you weren't able to vote, did you take the election seriously? Do you do that? Like, do you, do you go into the, the policy detail of the various political parties or do you leave that alone? What do you do? Do you, do you read the manifestos? Have you ever read a political manifesto before? If you have, you know how hilarious they are. They are ludicrous. Any political manifesto that I've ever read is ludicrous. Because you know what happens if you read it. They, <laughs> they project a utopian dream uh, to the reader of the manifesto, don't they? You know, if you only vote SNP, the world. The world will be a beautiful place. If you only vote for Labour, everything will be rosy. If you vote for the Tories, it's the same thing. Now, you know as well as I do, that's just fantasy. That's nonsense. That's guff. But what you've got right now in front of you is the real deal. Because having spoken about the king in his perfection, having then spoken about the type of rule, as we close, what God does here is he shows us the results of the king's rule. I'm saying to you, honestly, it's, it's the most beautiful thing you'll ever read in your life. So I want you to take scripture in your hands, and I want you to look at verse 6, and I'm going to point out really briefly four things. This beautiful picture of peace. So have you got it? Verse 6. First of all, note that reconciliation, because I reckon most of us are familiar with that language, are we? Do you see it? There's mention of the wolf dwelling with the lamb. But does everyone, as you look down verse 6, do you see what you've actually got? Do you see what it is? You've got predators, and they're dwelling at peace with their Prey? Isn't that what you've got? Reconcile predators and prey. Look at it. Wolf and lamb, leopard and goat, lion and calf. Lovely. But the language is amazing because it's the language of hosting. So it's almost as though the lamb has shouted over to the wolf, come over and stay with me. Come in. I'll show you some hospitality. You see, they're at peace. It's reconciliation. Work on. Work down. Look at verse 7. You've had reconciliation. Now note the reform. Because if you look at verse 7, isn't there almost as though there's a change, a fundamental change comes over the animals and the beasts? Look at it. Look at it. Because of the king's rule, the bear is no longer carnivorous. Do you see? The bear is 
grazing with a cow. Do you see? And then you've got a lion eating straw. Does everyone get what that is? Isn't it Edenic language? Isn't it the language of the Garden of Eden? Aren't we recalling there the peace and the purity of the garden? So we've got reconciliation and beautiful reform. But then look at verse 8. You've also got removal. Because it's almost quite Christmassy, isn't it? Verse 8, you've got kids playing. You've got this wee kiddie playing. It sounds beautiful. And you're thinking, ah, is it a Christmas present that he's playing with? Is it a toy he's playing with? What is it? Look at it. It's a snake. He's just playing with a cobra. Christian friends, you know what's going on. What is envisaged there surely is the removal of the curse. Isn't it? Because this king has crushed the serpent's head on the cross. Now we have this beautiful picture where man and serpent, man and snake will no longer be enemies and at war. So reconciliation, reform, removal, but then you get to the last verse. In verse 9 you see renewal at last. Do you notice in verse 9 how there's this extension? Do you see it? God's holy mountain no longer is just Zion, no longer just Jerusalem, but extends the knowledge of God to the ends of the earth. And it's that idea of the child pains, the groaning of creation in Romans 12. And it's finally released. And it's finally relaxed that what the king has brought about is peace on earth for all those upon whom his favor rests. And maybe if you look at that and you read that and you hear it, you study it, do you not now understand what I was saying at the very start of this sermon? We read this and surely we must resist having a small view of Christmas. Isn't that right? A small and significant view of the incarnation. Because what did Christ come to do? Christ Jesus is king. He's not just come to be a moral teacher. He's not just come to die, even. Christ has not even just come to forgive sin. It's bigger, it's brighter, it's more amazing. Christ Jesus had come to take his people, his bride, his church, to a renewed heaven and a renewed earth. That's the incarnation. Christ Jesus come amongst us to save us, to breathe life into us, to, to save you, to make us real, to make us in the God's people. But Christ has come that he might, through his life and death and resurrection, actually reform the cosmos. That Christ Jesus might take us, his church, to be with him in paradise. So honestly, as your minister, I say to you, enjoy your Christmas. You know, enjoy the festivities of this, this week, of course, but may it be for all of us in here that we have a bigger view of the gospel, a bigger view of Christmas. And most of all, may we all have a bigger view of Christ, bigger view of the King who today gives us hope, but who one day will take his people, his church that he's perfected, and he will usher us home to be with him. Friends, let's bow. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we do thank you so much that you have raised up for uh, your people the King, the King of kings. We thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ is uh, righteous and true. We thank you that he is mighty to save. And we thank you, Lord God, for your great plan to bring your bride to yourself, that we might live at peace with you eternally. So we do thank you and we praise you, and we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen.